This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is Microsoft's latest two-part invention. It's the Microsoft Surface Book. Looks like a 13-inch laptop. It is a 13-inch laptop, but it's got a real neat trick. You press a little button on the keyboard, and it separates and becomes a tablet, or a clipboard, as Microsoft likes to call it. And you have a 13.5-inch display, slightly odd size there, instead of 13.3-inch, and that is the brains, just like a Surface Pro in many ways. Everything is in here except for the optional dedicated GPU. If you do get that, that is in the keyboard. And that introduces a few wrinkles and a few bugs that we're going to talk about. But Microsoft has said a lot about how this is the most powerful 13-inch laptop ever, and it's twice as fast as a MacBook Pro with Retina display. They didn't specify the size. We'll assume 13-inch. Not quite the case. In some ways, it is the case. We'll talk about that, too. Anyway, very well equipped here, running on Ultrabook ULV 6th generation Intel Skylake CPU. So that's 15 watt CPUs in here, not the quad core higher power CPU that we saw in the Viozu Canvas we recently looked at. But as Ultrabooks go, it's one of the sharper knives in the draw. It's also one of the most expensive. We're going to look at it now. So this is it, finally, Microsoft Surface Book. And thanks for your patience. A lot of things to test here. And you know, I like to be pretty thorough with this. This won't be a short review. Uh, you can guess that already. Anyway, this is Microsoft's first laptop. Of course, they make the Surface Pro line of tablets, which can be used as laptops, but they're not primarily laptops. And Microsoft made a big deal in their presentation about how this was the fastest 13-inch laptop ever, and they were trash-talking Apple laptops. Now, before you say, oh my god, reviewers just love Apple products, why you always mention it? It's because Microsoft does. Every time they roll out a new product, which granted isn't that often, they have to try to smack down on Apple products, so they invite that kind of comparison. Sometimes I think it's silly, like when they compared the MacBook Air to the Surface Pro. I mean, how different could products be, actually? Anyway, we will talk about how this compares the 13-inch Retina MacBook Pro occasionally, and we'll show you what the difference is like. But honestly, this is its own kind of animal, and in the same way that Surface Pro is its own sort of animal, because it's not just a laptop. It's a laptop with an absolutely normal keyboard here, sturdy magnesium casing, nice build quality, 13.5-inch display versus the usual 13.3-inch whatever. 3 by 2 aspect ratio, that is a little bit different since most laptops are 16 by 9 widescreen. It's what Microsoft likes, and I like it pretty well too. You get more height here when you're reading documents, you're reading web pages. It's the same aspect ratio as many of us shoot with digital cameras, so that kind of makes sense there. If you turn it around side view right here, it still looks like a normal laptop except for the fulcrum hinge, which is a pretty weird kind of thing right here. You just see how that works. It actually expands and contracts a little bit. It's kind of it's creepy looking. It reminds me of a lobster tail, sort of. Anyway, the idea with that hinge is not just to be weird and different, though it does help because for marketing purposes, if this really stands out visually and everybody says, oh, you got a Surface Book, it's a win for Microsoft. But it's supposed to balance the top and the bottom. The top and the bottom, each part weighs about the same. Uh, with normal laptops, most all the brains, really all the brains are in the bottom section. So all the weights here, it helps it from being top heavy. So the idea is the fulcrum hinge can help with that. Now, it doesn't go that far back. It's not too, too far back. Now, the confusing thing is if the machine is sleeping or off, it doesn't go that far back. So if you, if you play with one, you try one out in the store and the screen is sleeping, it'll only go back about this far. In fact, you know, I'll shut it off so we can see that. And the power button is right up top right there. Wake it up again and you get full range of motion. And by the way, we have Windows Hello enabled here. So it just looked at my face and unlocked itself, which is pretty neat. It uses the front 5 megapixel camera to do that. This hinge also is a fairly complex thing, and it, it adds certainly to the cost of this relatively very expensive Ultrabook. It starts at $1,500, goes all the way up to $3,000. For $1,500, that's the base model Core i5. No dedicated GPU there for you. 8 gigs of RAM, 120 gig of SSD. It's a pretty basic model there. If you want to move up to the, now this is slightly a moving target with Microsoft right now, to the dedicated GPU, and the GPU is in the dock, not in this. So in theory, if you could get a hold of a dock separately, that could work. Anyway, we have the $2,099, so that's $2,100 configuration, Core i7, 8 gigs of RAM, 256 gig SSD inside and the custom NVIDIA GPU. There's also a Core i5 with the dedicated GPU for a couple of hundred dollars less. If you want to go up to 512 gigs of storage, you're looking around 2600, talking $3,000 if you want a terabyte of storage. All of these are 
Ultrabook CPU is 15 watt ULV CPU is not the quad cores that you'll find say in the Dell XPS 15, the 15 inch Retina MacBook Pro or the Vio Z Canvas tablet that we recently reviewed. But getting back to design, let's see what happens when you detach it. You press a button right over here to detach it and if you're allowed to detach it, the little LED in the corner will glow green to let you know. Now what is that about? That's because it might be using the dedicated GPU. Now just sitting here on the desktop, it's not using the dedicated GPU, but say you're running Adobe Illustrator or Premiere Pro or a game or something like that, the GPU is being used, you can't just unplug it from the, the computer, which essentially really is the top half of the tablet without, well, serious mayhem happening. So that's why Microsoft went with this fairly complex and expensive hinge that uses muscle wires, electromechanical. There are magnets here for alignment purposes as well and to keep it pretty stiff and steady. So that explains why we got that going on there. Makes a little click, says ready to detach, and it's still pretty firm, and you just grab it. And you can use it as a tablet. You can use it as a tablet for about three hours. There's a battery in the tablet section, which really has all the brains, the CPU, the RAM, the SSD, everything c computationally is in here. Bigger battery is in the base. Happily, you can plug the charger in right here. It uses the same magnetic pogo connector that Microsoft's been using on Surface Pros. So yes, you can charge this separately or use it separately. Say you're an artist and you're going to go for a real long drawing session. I was using this for drawing three hours really is about what you can get out of it. Now together it's pretty remarkable. Microsoft's claiming around 12 hours and they are not kidding. This thing really is an energizer bunny. It's pretty impressive that. When you're using it just as a tablet, as you can see we have the included new Surface Pro pen here, the new one with the eraser that feels rubbery and actually feels like an eraser. Magnetically docks right there just like on Surface Pro 4. We have ventilation holes all around the side. These are locator pins and stuff like that. And of course the data connectors for the keyboard dock. It does come with a keyboard dock. That's not sold separately, unlike Surface Pro 4. Excuse, excuse me, Microsoft. Really, you should start including that with Surface Pro 4. More ventilation. We have a headphone jack right here. We have volume controls up top and a power button. And that is it. Nice magnesium casing there. So connectivity pretty much zip if you're just using this. Now on the keyboard dock, that's where you're going to find your ports. SD card slot, card sticks out about halfway. Two USB 3.0 ports right there. Mini display port, and yes it can drive a 4K display at 60 Hz. We have tested it and there is the charging connector, the pogo pin connector. Still not exactly what you would call a wealth of ports, but it's decent. It's enough to get by on. Little ventilation holes actually here in the keyboard for the GPU. Keyboard has 1.5 millimeters of travel, just one little bit short of the 1.6 that would be considered like a full stroke keyboard. It feels quite nice. Some people have complained about a lack of contrast on the keyboard with the key masking. Uh, backlight on, backlight off, I have not had a problem with it. Try the HP Spectre X360 if you really want to have problems with contrast. They really have white letters masking on the keys. It feels good. It's really nice to type on. It might not be the deepest travel. It's not freaky short like the 12-inch MacBook, but I find it very nice to type on. And this certainly, this and the Surface Pro 4 type cover are some of the best trackpads I have ever used in Windows. It just feels responsive. It doesn't do weird things every so often. It doesn't just stop scrolling suddenly when you're using two-fingered scrolling. It's precise. Accidents don't happen with it. It's good. And we have a very MacBook like cutout right here. Can you open this one-handed when you're using it as a laptop? No, not really. They, the, it's really a pretty stiff hinge and it's hard to do that and it starts walking around the table if you try. And now for a few physical comparisons. This is the 13-inch Retina MacBook Pro right here and you can see the Surface Book has a little bit bigger footprint on it. It is 13.5 versus 13.3 inches plus there's the difference in the aspect ratios there that account for it. This is going to be a bit taller because of that aspect ratio. I'm perfectly happy with that trade-off. They weigh about the same. The dedicated GPU model of this is 3.48 pounds, exactly what the 13-inch Retina MacBook Pro weighs. 3.34 pounds if you don't go with the integrated, a uh, dedicated GPU rather. And we'll close them up. 
two lovely pieces of well-made silver right there. Now, in terms of the performance difference that Microsoft made a, such a big deal about, they were really putting a spin on things. I mean, at the launch event, they made me want to throw down my credit card. And then I thought about, my God, look how expensive this thing is. And it began my love-hate relationship with the Surface Book. But in terms of CPU performance, these are actually pretty similar, which is impressive because the Mac actually has a slightly higher wattage CPU for better performance. Of course, the Mac is a generation older. They haven't come out with the Skylake ones yet. It probably will catch up and maybe surpass Surface Book by a little bit. So pretty much a wash in terms of CPU performance. Both are available to Core i5, Core i7s right there. Where the Surface Book can pull ahead is if you do get the dedicated graphics option. That dedicated graphics option is not the sharpest knife in the drawer. It's a custom GPU with 384 CUDA cores. Pretty much specification-wise, it's like the NVIDIA 940M doesn't even rank a GT or a GTX in front of it because it's one of the lower end 900 series GPUs. Does have one gig of DDR5 VRAM versus two gigs of DDR3 in some competing laptops like say the ThinkPad Yoga 14, the Acer Aspire E5 that we recently reviewed. There are a couple of options out there to get that same GPU, of course not in a tablet form factor with a pen and all those other neat things necessarily. But if you get the dedicated GPU, yes, it will be faster because here we're just running on Intel Iris integrated graphics. So for those of you who need that little extra GPU push, you are not going to be playing Dragon Age Inquisition at high frame rates and high settings on this guy by no means. But you will get an extra oomph for Adobe Premiere, Illustrator, again, those programs that actually make use of the dedicated graphics. And here we have it with the HP Spectre X360, who we lovingly called Bob, best of the best among Ultrabooks. A lot cheaper, closer to $1,000. Now, our model is the Core i7 with the 256 gig SSD and 8 gigs of RAM in here, and that one's about $1,149. No dedicated GPU there, though. Again, that's going to be the one that sets the Surface Book apart if you're going for that $1,800 or above option there. This one has more ports on it. This is also extremely good looking machine and if you don't really need dedicated GPU and the Microsofty goodness and all that sort of thing of having a genuine Microsoft product, this is still a very good buy. It has a 360 degree hinge though so you can't separate the tablet section to make it even lighter for those of you who are graphic artists. There is a Synaptics pen that's available optionally for the Spectre X360 however. And here we have it with the new Surface Pro 4, the new type cover 4 as well. Computationally, if you're not talking about the dedicated GPU option, these are really the same. Keep that in mind. The Surface Pro 4 starts out cheaper. Of course, that's with the Core M3 processor, which is less powerful, but the Core i5 will cost you $999, so considerably cheaper. The, the desirable one is the $1,300 model that has a Core i5 8 gigs of RAM and 256 gig SSD just like this one has and we will be doing a separate comparison of this. I'm not going to spend too much time on this now. It won't be a smackdown because really it's going to just be a matter of which one suits your needs better more than one is so vastly superior to the other. Lastly in our compendium of desirable machines that might compete. We have the Vio Z Canvas that we recently reviewed. This is a 12.3 inch tablet with a very sturdy keyboard and when you put it on it looks pretty much just like a laptop. The Vio Z Canvas has a quad core CPU. It's about twice as fast as the Surface Book in terms of computational speed. It has Intel Iris GT3 graphics as Iris Pro. That's the fastest you can get. So it's a little bit slower than the dedicated GPU options available in Surface Book, but you know it's not leaps and bounds because neither of these is super duper fast when it comes to GPU acceleration. Now the Vio Z Canvas has much higher color gamut. That's one thing that's in favor of it for those of you who do pr pr print production stuff or video production professionally. It's also twice as fast. And the funny thing is it came out just before Surface Book and uh, it used to seem ungodly expensive, but now it kind of seems like a reasonable price compared to Surface Book. Anyway, we're going to have a complete smackdown between these two as well so you can find out all the differences between these. But this guy starts around $2,100 to give you an idea of pricing and that gets you that quad core i7 and Intel Iris Pro graphics and the keyboard dock is included. This comes with a compact charger not unlike the Surface Pro charger. This separates right here if you need to transport it and it has the USB port so if you want to charge your phone or 
whatever USB based accessory you have, you can do that. So nice and light in the bag, but honestly, this has such good battery life, you're probably just not going to need it unless you just want to use the tablets, tablets separately away from the keyboard. The keyboard, by the way, and the base, how does, how does that work? The keyboard and the, well, really the clipboard, the tablet, how does that work? When you charge it, it's going to charge the tablet first, just in case you want to detach and go, and then it will charge the keyboard. The keyboard does not actively charge the tablet if they're not plugged into AC, however, so it's not going to top this up if you're unplugged from AC. But when it is plugged into AC, right here on the base, it will charge both of these together, so don't, you don't have to worry about that part. So how about synthetic benchmarks? Again, we have the Core i7, that's the i7-6600U processor, the Core i5 is going to score a little bit lower. Usually there's about a 10% difference between the Core i5 and the Core i7 ULV at most. So you can see our Geekbench 3 score here, very healthy score. Again, about similar to the 13-inch Retina MacBook Pro, also running with a Core i7 CPU. Although with the, the Mac, it's kind of a funny thing. The Core i5 and the Core i7 don't really score much differently at all. And there aren't many Skylake U-Series Ultrabooks out yet on the market to compare this with, but when we get the refresh of the Spectre, the XPS 13 and stuff like that, we'll include that in our written review and update it as necessary. Right now it's pulling ahead of the fifth generations by a bit. Usually we see about 3,000 and 6,000 to give you an idea, or 6,500. So it's pulling a little bit of, above its weight right here. And PC Mark 8, this is the home accelerated test. You can see we scored 2,952. Again, a very healthy result right there. Now, how about 3, 3D stuff? Again, we have the dedicated GPU here, and I know a lot of you are going to be interested in that because that is one of the things that sets this apart. For Unigine Heaven 4, we're running it at 1920 by 1080 resolution, not the native 3000 by 2000 pixel resolution. That would just not be fair at all. It managed 20.9 frames per second, which results in a score of 527. It's not going to set the world on fire, but that's nice, and it certainly is better than integrated graphics. Yeah, so it's going to give you that little extra oomph, as Microsoft liked to show in Tomb Raider, for example, or in Bioshock Infinite and in video editing, at least when doing transitions that depend on the GPU. For just the regular playing of frames, usually it just uses the CPU. For our 3D Mark 11 test, you can see the performance mode test, which is 1280 by 720 P 2447. That's a pretty healthy score, and that's certainly double what integrated graphics will normally deliver. For the extreme test, it scored X878, again, about twice as fast as integrated graphics, so that's nice to see. Now, to give you an idea of how a gaming laptop would score. Like some of the big gaming laptops will be reviewed like Alienware 15, for example, or the MSI GT Dominator that have an NVIDIA GT, GT 970M or 980M in there. This is about a third of their score to a quarter. So it's all on a continuum here, folks, is the point. CloudGate scored 7740, Ice Storm Unlimited 88,501, Fire Strike 1882. Now just for a little comparison, on 3D Mark 11, the Surface Pro 4, the Core i5 and integrated Intel 520 graphics scored 1574 for the performance test and the extreme test, it scored 431. So there you go, it's about half of what this guy can do with the dedicated GPU. So how about display quality? It's really very nice. Uh, Microsoft calls this their Pixel Sense display, 3000 by 2000 resolution, so quite high resolution there. Comes from the factory running at 200% scaling because really native resolution, native scaling would be just too hard for most of us to see. It has very good viewing angles, IPS like viewing angles. Other than glare, you're not going to see much going on there. Extremely bright, 375 nits of brightness. That's one of the brighter displays. It does have plenty of glare. As you notice, there's lots of glare going on here. It uses optically bonded glass. It should actually reduce reflections, but alas, it still does reflect. Color gamut, 99% of sRGB. So it doesn't come close to matching the Vio Z canvases, 95% of Adobe RGB, which is a much wider color spectrum, but for everyday production work, for most people who do stuff for the web, that's absolutely fine. Your target really is sRGB there. Adobe RGB is more for print, for cinema, for things like that. So good color gamut, also very good delta E. That means the color calibration from the factory was spot on. They do cal calibrate each one of these and supposedly every Surface Pro 4 at the factory before they ship it to make sure that the colors are good. The screen is sharp. 
you could certainly separate this and use it as an ebook reader if you wanted to. I think 13.5 inches is a little bit big for that. If you're into that kind of thing, Surface Pro 4 or something even smaller could make sense. Well, let's check out and see how something looks in the Kindle Metro app. We're going to look at Accidental Killer by Tang Zhang, who is our senior editor. Check it out. You can actually get her book. And let's do something interesting and see side by side, really nice, really sharp. Okay, you can do that, that's fine. And probably for something this big, it might make sense, but what if you wanna use it in portrait mode? We're gonna undock it and turn it into portrait mode. One of the benefits of the three by two aspect ratio is that it's less awkward to hold in portrait mode. And there we go, as you drag it down, it's gonna go automatically into a single page view. This is kinda of nice, isn't it? This is like a digital document. Now the tablet section weighs only 1.6 pounds, so that's about as heavy as the original 10 inch iPad, way back when, the first one. So that's not all that heavy, and it's pretty balanced in your hands. It is actually nice for reading. Again, size might be a little big. You might wanna go for Surface Pro 4 or something like that, but it certainly renders beautifully and sharply. I mean, look at the text on that. Just nice. All right, I know you're here for the pen. I am kind of the pen lady, aren't I? We have the latest version of the Ntrig pen here. Well, really, the, the pen is a nice little thing, but what's important here is the improvements in the digitizer that allow for 1024 pressure levels, just like the Surface Pro 4 and also like the, the Via Z canvas. But we're going to take a detailed look at the pen now. But first off, I just want to show you what it looks like if you detach it and remount it like so, which you can do. Now, why would you do this? Because it's heavy now, right? It's your, your three and a half pounder. In case you're using a graphics program that really benefits from the GPU, this is how you would do it and still be able to draw on the screen. Now, I'm going to detach it because the programs that we're showing really generally don't need much help. If you're working on CAD or something like that you're going to want to use it certainly attached to the base but if you're using clip studio pro or art rage or any of the popular drawing programs it's actually fine with integrated graphics so first off we're going to start off with clip studio paint now i am not a pro at using this so forgive me if i don't do everything just the way you might i'm going to go for manga i have a feeling that's popular with a lot of you folks and we're just going to test drawing and stuff like that but first subjectively speaking the new pen has a rubbery tip it doesn't make nearly as much noise you don't hear that clack 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 on the glass it provides more drag so it feels much more like drawing it still doesn't feel like using a pen and paper i mean no kidding it's just not going to also, the rubbery eraser really is rubbery. It won't scratch your screen and it will erase. Now in Clip Studio Pen, you have the option of using either WinTab or Tablet PC. Microsoft does provide WinTab drivers on their website if you want to use WinTab. And you know, I expected WinTab to be better because in a lot of these programs, the initial support for Tablet PC or Windows Ink APIs was pretty poor. I actually find I like it better using Windows Ink and, and not using WinTab, but you can do it. So the first thing people like to see is how fast can you draw a line. It's lagging a little bit behind there, but I'm going awful darn fast and it's doing smooth circles. The other thing is pen jitter, which is usually shown with a diagonal line. Now if you do a quick diagonal line, notice the pressure sensitivity by the way there, nice. It's fine, it's when you go slowly and there's still some pen jitter. Now this program actually has adjustments for that that can help reduce that. Most programs don't though. So if you go super slow, if you're a really slow drawer, you're still gonna have some pen jitter there. If you're kind of a normal average speed like that, it's absolutely fine. The pressure sensitivity is lovely. Now, the folks at Entrig actually used to claim that you can't feel the difference between 256 and 1024 levels of pressure sensitivity and that the buttery feel that we had with Wacom digitizers was based on a difference in technology, not because of the pressure sensitivity. I don't know what it is, but they're starting to approach the feel of Wacom here for that buttery smoothness. This is a much more pleasant experience. And you can do light things to fill in and then heavy, it's just really nice. And the pen parallax, there's always gonna be some. That means the tip offset from where you think the pen is or see where the pen is on the there versus where the pointer is. Entrig typically has less pen par parallax issues and has less difficulty with being on the very edges of the screen. Doing this with some Wacom digitizers, for example, is pretty darn tough, and you can do it here. 
Now we're in Autodesk Sketchbook, which always works well with anything that uses Windows in KPIs. You don't even need WinTemp here. One thing I want to say is you do have palm rejection, and what you have to do, though, is make sure it sees the cursor. Once you see the crosshairs or the pen dot on the screen, even though I'm about a half an inch away, then you know you can rest your hand on the glass. Otherwise, it might vector. Now, in this program, I still notice some vectoring. Let's see if I can manage to draw a quick apple here without causing any palm prints that I'll have to erase afterwards. And it's working out pretty well so far. If you lift your hand off the glass, you just have to remember. And actually, that's pretty good. And by the way, the eraser, just as much as you might imagine, works just like that. No side clicky buttons here. The only thing you've got is this acts like a button, and you're actually going to pair it. Unlike most Entrig pens, you pair it not just not because you need it to draw. You actually don't. You can interchange these pens. You can use this on the ViOZ canvas and use its pen on here. But because it has functionality that starts Cortana if you press and hold the button, which is pretty neat if you want to start a search. If you do a quick press, it's going to bring up OneNote. And if you do a double press, you can take a screenshot. And it also has a little LED indicator light now. So when you're pairing it, you can look at the light and say, yep, that's actually working. So I find this perfectly pleasant. I, I have no great desire to go running back to Wacom, Wacom Cintiq or something like that. Lastly, we're in Corel Painter 2016, which again supports both WinTab or the Windows Ink API. You have your choice here. And we're actually going with WinTab right now. I love this program for natural media style painting and drawing. So you can get very nice loaded oil kind of look right there. It's responsive. It's not bulky at all. The pen location is pretty much right where it should be. And we'll do a little airbrushing now. Response is good. Now, if we use a really fat brush on this, let's see what we can do if we can slow it down, because sometimes that can be a problem for rendering. And we'll go with a insane 385 pixel wide brush. And we are seeing some delay there, especially this is a little bit tough because it's an airbrush. It has to do a lot more computation. Let's switch back to the oil brush and see how it handles that. And we are 401. Now that's a whole lot easier. So that's pretty good in terms of computational speed. You can see where it actually fills in the blocks as it's drawing those. So, a dual core ULV CPU can only do so much, but it does get the job done. It doesn't screw up in any way whatsoever. You're just going to notice it filling in the blanks if you use an absurdly large pen. I don't know how many of you would ever use a 400 wide pixel brush though. Oh, now we're in Civ 5 for a little gaming. First off, listen to the speakers before I turn the volume down because they're that loud and full. It really is quite nice. Let's bring that down now. I have a game I've spent about 45 minutes on so far, so it's somewhat developed right here. We're running at 1920 by 1080 medium quality settings, not running at full native resolution. I did try that, but, well, things did get kind of bulky and slow. It really wasn't that enjoyable. Not that Civ is really very demanding graphically speaking, but that's just, it was too much for it anyway. So here we can pan around pretty nicely and pretty smoothly right there. You can use touch with this. I'm going to use the trackpad so you can see what's going on on the screen. Now the turn time is not wicked fast. This is not a gaming PC where you've got a lot of cores to throw it in. And real-time strategy games and, and even this sort of strategy game that isn't real-time, it just takes a little bit of time to compute what's going on there. But it's quite playable. Now to be fair, this is a game a lot of Ultrabooks can play because it's not very graphically demanding. And this does have the same CPU offerings that you would find, say, in... Surface Pro 4 or the HP Spectre X360 or any number of Ultrabooks. So. But it does the job just fine. And I know this is a pretty popular one. But a lot of Ultrabook players, so there it is. Civ 5 running and really good audio. Next we're going to check out Tomb Raider. Now we're going to play Tomb Raider. You can see the settings we're using. 1920 by 1200. Couldn't find a 3 by 2 aspect ratio that was any better... We are suitable for it, so that's what we got right here. We 60 hertz for our refresh speed, and our quality is at low. Now, this is one case where the Surface 
MacBook is twice as fast as the 13-inch Retina MacBook Pro when it comes to graphics and gaming if you have the dedicated GPU. Games will get a little extra um from the dedicated GPU. Like I said, it's pretty close to the, the NVIDIA 940M, so enough to make games that are fairly friendly to lower-end hardware-friendly kind of games play. That would be Bioshock Infinite, that would be Skyrim, that would be our own Tomb Raider right here. And we have the frame rate counter in the upper left corner there, Fraps, and we're pegging it at 60 right now, which is pretty darn impressive. Dropping it down a little bit. Yeah. So are there other Ultrabooks that can do this? The ones that separate into a tablet? No. The one that would come the closest is again the Vio Z Canvas. The Intel Iris Pro graphics can also handle Tomb Raider pretty well. We have a demo of that. Not quite as well as this though, but certainly a playable frame rate. If you're looking at something like the ThinkPad Yoga 14 that had the 940M graphics in there, it will perform not quite as fast as this, but somewhat similarly. And then we talked about the very affordable Acer Aspire E5 that we reviewed not too long ago. That's 650 bucks. That also has a Core i5 with Core i7 option and the 940M GPU inside. And it it's not quite as fast as this still. So this is really coming out on top. But it was very playable though. And it certainly it could reach the 50s, the 40s to the 50s in terms of frame rates here. So you don't have to spend this much money, but you do have to spend this much money if you want something that is both a light tablet and an ultrabook and a potential light gaming machine as well. Again, heat and noise are really well managed. You can still hear it blowing right now because we just quit Tomb Raider moments ago, but this is an 80 degree room with spotlights on the device. So that adds to the heat. It's not loud, it's not intrusive, it's a lot quieter than Surface Pro 3 was, certainly, and also Surface Pro 4 has gotten quieter, but that's a separate review. It does not get burning hot anywhere. When you're playing something like Tomb Raider, though, it'll get hot enough to make your hands sweat. It's not going to burn you, but it's going to get pretty darn hot right here. If you're doing something like editing video in Premiere, it's going to get quite warm, not as hot as it does when you're doing something like playing Tomb Raider. So overall, Microsoft's new hybrid cooling system is really working well. Now, while we talk about that, if you've seen the cutaway pictures that Microsoft has shown, you notice that they've got copper and they've got heat pipes running everywhere on this. This is not a machine that you're going to open up to upgrade. God even knows how you would upgrade this. You probably have to use a suction cup kind of device just to pull the display off to get to the innards on this. Not designed to upgrade later, so get the amount of RAM and the amount of internal storage that you want. So that's the Surface Book, Microsoft's first laptop. And I have to say, I have something of a love-hate relationship with it. I love the design on it. I love having a bigger screen when I need it. Sometimes the 12-inch screen can seem a little bit cramped, or even when you go up to 12.3. I like the performance on this a lot. I do sometimes wish it had the oomph of the Vio-Z canvas with the quad-core CPU, but we can't have everything, and that's a heavier machine as a result, too. The tablet section is quite a bit heavier. Some of the things I'm not thrilled about are the price. This thing is so gosh darn expensive. Ouch. And the other thing is, is, and this is a work in progress, just as we've had this for about a week, I've noticed how it actually has improved when it comes to the detachable GPU design right here. Docking and undocking it, when we first had it, was an essay in not even frustration, but in sometimes in mild terror as to what it was going to do. It would get confused. Sometimes the screen would just go black. Occasionally when we were gaming, we would get GPU disconnect error messages, which gets really confusing because sometimes you can actually see that, say, in a desktop where you can't physically disconnect your graphics card. So that can be a driver error, or it could be something with the hinge assembly here. I'm thinking it's probably the drivers. I do wish we could use NVIDIA GeForce desktop software with this, but this is a custom GPU, and that was not meant to be. Microsoft said it's always just going to be driver updates through Windows updates, so no GeForce experience and all the nifty stuff that that brings here. 
So, yeah, but like I said, in the week that we've had it, it's gotten a lot better. That We've disconnected and reconnected it a million times without rebooting while doing this video, putting it front ways, putting it back ways, running it in both modes, and it has not crashed. It has not done anything weird. At first, I saw strange things when logging in. Sometimes it would take an unusually long time just to log in. It, clearly, there were bugs Microsoft has ironed out, and this is a production-level device, by the way, in terms of hardware. And, of course, this is shipping now, so we have all the latest drivers, just like you would if you went and bought it at the store. So like, just like the Surface Pro was when it first came out, I'm sure there's going to be little niggling things that go on for a while with this device, but it is certainly elegant, it's powerful, and it is unique in terms of being a 1.6 pound tablet that when docked can suddenly be a monster with a decent, not high performance, but decent dedicated GPU in the base. So that's the Microsoft Surface Book, certainly a unique look, and I think that's important to Microsoft, just the way the Surface Pro has become iconic with its kickstand and small portable size. You recognize it instantly, you see it on TV shows, the whole thing. I think this one's going to be pretty recognizable for a long time, too. It's the only one with this interesting fulcrum hinge here. Well, I call it the lobster tail hinge. Two-part design, but very much a powerful tablet if you separate it. And that's one of the things that sets it apart. There aren't too many two-in-one convertibles that are this powerful in terms of getting an optional dedicated GPU, certainly inside. Of course, the caveat is you're going to have to leave it plugged into the keyboard. Even if you do reverse it, put it on backwards and hold the whole three and a half pound package. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review. Yes, we will have a lot of comparisons and smackdowns with this and other devices. And subscribe to our YouTube channel.